Hey guys, this is Matt Winning at winningstrength.com and today we're going to talk conjugate system. Now conjugate system was made very famous by the currently late Louis Simmons in America, but in reality it started way, way back with the Soviets somewhere in the early 60s. And I wanted to bring you guys some background on conjugate system to hopefully start to help buy you in on why you should be using it or at least portions of it to make your lifting better, make your career longer and hopefully stay away from injury. So let's get at it. Lately I've been living like I can't take a loss. They ain't wanna help me, that's what made me a boss. You can't kill my confidence, I think I'm the man. We don't give a f that's what they don't understand. I'm back again like flu season. I broke records while I lose leaf and I'm coming now on my roof leaving. Don't give a f I don't care. Uh did the f by my lonesome. No wonder now I'm on one. No shortcuts on that long run. All I really want is my share. Well, we can all give credit to the Soviet Union when it comes to training. Why? Well, if you read a couple of big time books like Super Training by Mel Sif, you'll start understanding that the Soviets were not only making and experimenting with the conjugate system in the 60s, they actually go back to looking at blood work and all kinds of physical parameters by doctors all the way back into the 1890s and early 1900s. This puts them nearly 100 years ahead of America. Now, a lot of people want to blame the Soviet Union for anabolic steroids, and that's the reason they were progressing. But in my personal and professional opinion, the reason that the Soviets were so far ahead is because they were willing to take physicians, physics professors, and other things, and put them at the highest level in order to understand training way, way faster than we did. Now, Bulgaria, Bulgaria is also another massive country that's rich in training history and experience. Their extensive work with the Max Effort Method created some of the best strength athletes to ever walk the planet, no matter the generation. But the difference is the Bulgarian system was entirely directed towards Max Effort work. They had a very small amount of exercises, somewhere around six or eight movements for two exercises, which would be the clean and jerk and the snatch. So as an Olympic lifter, you would do the clean and jerk and the snatch. They only had six or eight different rotated movements that they would do, and they would go as heavy as possible all the time. But if you dig deep into the Bulgarian book, you start realizing that they understood the difference between a training maximum and a comp maximum. This means that they did whatever they could do that day, but they didn't put a lot of neurological stress on the athlete unless it was a competitive fashion. This is where I started to understand that you do need max effort work in your weekly regimen, but you don't need it at what people think max work is, which is failure. You need it close to failure to stimulate growth and accommodate to the load. Anything above that is overtraining. Bulgaria, though, had some issues with this particular system. They would start off with roughly 1,500 to 2,000 athletes per weight class, and by the time each Olympic cycle came down, they would only have three or four guys in each weight class left to compete for the top spot to, to compete for Bulgaria. This is not a good system for numbers or a great system to follow. Why? Because who wants to use a system that breaks 99.9% .9 of the athletes to find the 0.001% of the population? You don't. So the Soviets started to realize that with this vast array of basically knocking people out of the game, it's great for selecting the, the top two, but it's not great for an entire community. This is where Vasily Alexeyev and the Russians come along with the Dynamo Club. And in the Dynamo Club, they had over 75 elite athletes that were capable of breaking world records at any time with hundreds of athletes that they trained with that were all capable of Olympic level status within a matter of a year or two. Why? Well, the Soviets had almost 75 variations of the clean and jerk and the snatch. High bar, low bar squats, front squats, high pulls, traditional clean and jerk and snatches. The list goes on and on. Pin pulls, deficit deadlifting. But the thing of it is, is that with rotation comes longevity and redu reduction of mileage. And the Soviets figured out if they were going to dump millions and millions of dollars into their metal system, why only have two athletes in each weight class when you can have, say, dozens and dozens to select from? It's a pretty smart idea. That's when the conjugate system really started to take off. So I would say around 1970, 74, Alexiev was so winning in his Olympic lifting stature they allowed him to train what he wanted to train. And this is when the floodgates opened and he started to create some of the greatest Olympic athletes, not only including himself, but others that the world had ever seen. And his array of exercises were so vast, it was ungodly. 
this started to strike a lot of controversy because we didn't learn about this stuff until Louis Simmons in the 90s where Louis was getting these, these uh, translated texts over from the Soviet Union. So in reality, the conjugate system is very old. Now, since the Olympic lifting only has two lifts, the number of exercises had to accumulate more and more and more. And this is what's really funny. As they did a measurement of these athletes and were asking them questions, only two of the athletes out of the 100 or plus team members were satisfied with 70. They wanted more variation. This is interesting. Because what we start to find is that psychological burnout is usually the main reason that most people quit training. They either get stale, they get bored, or they get injured. By creating a system that doesn't allow you to do that, or at least keeps it at bay, not only do you find more athletes, you also retain more athletes, which makes it more viable and more economic, right? If you're breaking everybody you got, and you just put hundreds of thousands of dollars in this athlete, and now he's broken, you can't use him for the Olympics, you can't use him for a medal, it's a bad situation. The Soviets also needed to be credited for the dynamic effort method. They started to realize that not only do they need to rotate movements, they also need to rotate percentages. Now it doesn't mean that the intent of the lift isn't insanely high. So if we look at the dynamic effort method, which is a sub-maximal method utilized under high rate of force or maximum intent, you start realizing that the motor unit recruitment to maximum effort method is very, very similar. What this means is that if you're rotating movements, say every 72 hours, then what you can do is do a heavy movement and then a fast movement. This is where Louis figured this out, is that you can move a lightweight fast and it's gonna have some of the same characteristics as moving a heavyweight slow. The rate of force is still very similar. So this opens up the floodgate to training in multiple percentages, therefore lowering the anxiety of training. So if we look at the max effort method, one of the biggest drawbacks to it is its anxiety and it's basically overtraining is very, very simple to do. If you're putting it in and schedule parameters, then you can use the maximum effort method with a high degree of capability with a low degree of burnout. I.e., this is when AS Prilipin comes along and creates the Prilipin chart. As we can see in the Prilipin chart, we are only supposed to max at a particular muscle group about four times a month. This means one time per week. So you can only go above or at 90% four times per month in a particular muscle group, i.e. the maximum effort method done every 144 hours. Okay, so as we break this down, we start realizing that not only Louis, but the Soviets were very mathematical and very in tune with how to train and how to get better. Why is this not absorbed in America? Simple, impatience. Most people are so impatient that they're not looking at what's gonna happen next year, they're looking at what's gonna happen next week. And that's why linear periodization is so effective in the West, is because it starts to pat everybody on the back every week with a different parameter all the time. Well, the conjugate system does the same thing, but it rotates the exercises and it maintains percentages. This means that in a, in a linear periodization sense, you're only gonna touch 90% maybe once every 10 weeks. Whereas the Soviet system would touch it once per week, and the Bulgarian system may touch it anywhere from three to four times per week. So we know one is massive overtraining, we know one is somewhere in the middle and close to optimal as possible, and we know one is not correct because you're not touching maximal weights often enough to get stronger. So I hope this starts to help you guys understand that not only was Louis Simmons onto something, but what he was onto was at that time 30 and 40 years old by the Eastern Bloc countries. The reason that you can only use old Eastern Bloc country research and data for training is very simple. One. Once you got elected or selected for the Olympic lifting committee to train, you were locked in barracks. You were told when to sleep, when to eat, and when to train. This meant that all the variables were heavily accounted for and you could actually train percentages. We're in America, we write a program and we don't tell somebody when to sleep, we don't fix their diet, and we don't fix their stress levels. Well, if you're living in a barrack and your only job is to train and you're getting fed and you're being told when to sleep, what's the stressor? nothing and that's why there will never be another Soviet Union or Eastern Bloc country and why we also put a flag on them in the gym to pay homage to these professors doctors and lifters that donated their entire prime of their life in order to understand how to train so I hope this really starts to spark some interest in you and read the right books which we posted on patreon read the old Louis Simmons articles go visit westsidebarbell.com I'm sure they still have older stuff on there and also check out our manuals where we put a lot of this data into our own training. 
Talk to you guys later and visit winningstrength.com. Lately I've been living like I can't take a loss. They wanna help me, that's what made me a boss. You can't kill my confidence, I think I'm the man. We don't give a f that's what they don't understand. I'm back again like flu season. I broke records while loose leaf and I'm